Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about family resiliency, supporting prevention, treatment, and recovery. Joining us in our panel today are Patricia Lincourt, Director of Practice Innovation and Care Management at the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, Albany, New York. Reverend Jan Brown, Founding Executive Director of Spirit Works Foundation, Center for Recovery of the Soul, Williamsburg, Virginia. Colonel Rebecca Porter, Director at DiLorenzo TRICARE Health Clinic, Washington, D.C. Dr. Mitra Ahatpur, Medical Officer in the Division of Pharmacologic Therapies, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mitra, what are some of the factors or issues that families face when they're looking at um, problems of mental and or substance use disorder within the family? Well, some of the issues, I mean, not each family is different. Uh, so we can't generalize for all families. Uh, but some of the common themes uh, across families are isolation, anger, trauma, um, guilt, and um, not knowing where to go for help. Uh, I think that's a really a big issue because when you're facing these issues, you're thinking you're the only one who in the whole society is facing these challenges. And you wonder, is there, and you don't want to discuss it with anyone because you feel, okay, everyone thinks uh, I have the perfect family. I don't want to, um, to let others know the difficulties I'm facing. Uh, but it would be nice uh, for them to know that this is something many families are facing, many challenges, and where to go for support and help. And we'll be talking about some of our own personal experiences a bit later on. Jan, how do these elements that Mitra just mentioned manifest themselves into activities of daily living? What, what happens to a family and what do they experience in the various nexus sure. that they are engaged in on a daily basis? So we see a lot of family members not doing social events, things that they would normally do with, with their friends, um, a reduction of participation in things like going to church. Um, what else? We see things like the children becoming less and less involved in school activities, um, sporting activities that they would normally do in the afternoon. Um, to touch upon just a bit, the discrimination and, and stigma, I think that's associated with both of those things, um, further deepens um, the isolation that most families feel. Very good. And Rebecca, for families that are in the military, are there special considerations even beyond what has been mentioned? Well, I think uh, what we try to do, uh, particularly in the Army, is make educators aware of what might be happening in a family. So, for example, if a service member is deployed to a combat zone, um, we would want to let the educators of that student know so that when they see changes in behavior, they can, they can put it into context of what's, what might be going on. Very good. And Patricia, in terms of how the family begins to look at their problems and begins to seek help. The concept of no wrong door, what can they help, we help them to interpret what that concept means? Well, I think it's a um, great uh, point for um, families because they don't know where to go. I think that was what you were saying, uh, doctor. And um, it, w it would be great that if a family could go anywhere in the system to their primary care physician, um, uh, to walk into a mental health clinic or to a substance use disorder clinic and have somebody there who can really help them to sort through what the problems are and help them find the right place if, if they aren't the right place to be able to provide all of the solutions. So that would be from uh, Mitra emergency rooms, uh, primary care physicians. Uh, so the pediatricians, uh, I mean, a lot of adolescents, uh, we found that there's some research that 90% of adults uh, 
um, who have substance use disorder started when they were adolescent. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to get the involvement of the pediatricians, uh, family physicians, um, internists, uh, emergency department, because people come for maybe other issues mm -hmm. that, uh, and uh, it would be nice to be screened for mental health and substance use issues and uh, get some kind of help of where can you be referred for a follow-up of where they can get more help. There's a lot of efforts, I think, currently to create integration in the system by forming better relationships between providers. Um, screening brief intervention, referral to treatment is exactly. one of those um, ha that has great potential if that happened at the pediatrician and then there was a relationship with a mental health or substance use provider to be able to do a seamless um, you know, connection to that service. Exactly, so it's like that warm handoff. So patients go to the emergency department, they get mm -hmm. the expert that's screening, but it's so important they get referral to treatment, but they never make that first appointment. So there are some hospitals that they put the system in place that they have social services in the hospital that mm -hmm. actually follows up with the patient when they are discharged from the hospital and makes that first appointment for them, which would be very helpful. And it's very critical. Jan, in terms of uh, communities of color and families of color, what special considerations should we be looking at within that community? I think some of the internalized oppression and people thinking that, that they can't reach out for help. Um, I think some of the uh, the considerations in terms of the care that people have historically received, um, and and so those are pretty challenging issues. And then some of the the issues around we don't need help, um, that that it's not okay to ask for help. So some of those systemic and cultural issues around those things as well. And I think what you mentioned before the shame and the stigma Absolutely. or the or the, the the, the discriminatory behaviors that, that affect sure. those that have a problem uh, are really something that I think within communities of color mm -hmm. are more pronounced, would Absolutely. you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. Rebecca, for the military families or the ones in the Army, let me, mm -hmm. let me be very specific. Um, how do we begin to engage the families uh, that, that have experience or are experiencing mental and substance use disorder? Well, I, I think uh, to Jan's point, it's important to realize that there is, there, there is often kind of a culture of stoicism in the military and that extends to the family members. So um, thinking that we're the only ones that have this problem or um, that we have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and go it alone. Um, realizing that that, um, that, that continues, that that kind of mindset can continue, even in the face of a lot of um, outreach efforts to help educate people. Um, going to back to your point about the no wrong door, um, that's part of why we've extended our behavioral health services into school systems and into schools, mm -hmm. so that if a teacher identifies a problem, there's a behavioral health professional right there in the school um, who has the permission of the parents to meet with the child, um, and so it kind of minimizes the need for for a more co uh, coordinated handoff between them. That, I mean, I think those are some of the things that we keep in mind. Very good, Patricia. Beyond what Rebecca has noted, um, in terms of the family, the when they're dealing with the problems. We've heard that the, the intersect can come through emergency room, primary care, but if there's a family that knows that there's some something is going wrong and there is, what is the first step that they should consider taking? The, um, often the first step that can be helpful, I think, is to seek help themselves, to reach out to somebody who um, is a professional who, or somebody who's a peer or a pastor or somebody in the helping profession to talk with them about um, what they're experiencing and to get ideas about um, what next steps to take. Very frequently, the person who um, has the problem isn't the first person who is seeking treatment. They sometimes need a lot of encouragement from their family 
in order to do that. And um, by the family reaching out for help, um, families in isolation, it's very difficult. But if they have a community of support around them, um, they can um, take action, I think, to help the person. There's a couple of models, including the craft model. Um, Which is? That, that um, the community reinforcement, um, particularly for adolescents, but um, has been used with adults too that um, supports families and gives um, incentives for the person um, who um, is experiencing the problem to connect to services. Well, when we come back, we're going to find out where we can get more information about those models and talk more about things that we can do to help these families. We'll be right back. Resilience is the ability to respond to stress, anxiety, trauma, crisis, or disaster. People develop resilience over time, and it is shaped by many factors, personal and environmental. Resilience is particularly important for members of the military, veterans, and their families. With recent military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, military families have faced multiple deployments and significant combat exposure. These experiences can be distressing to both members of the military and their families, challenging their resilience. Psychological distress experienced during combat can be further complicated by mental or substance use disorders. Many service members face issues such as trauma, suicide, homelessness, and or involvement with the criminal justice system. For example, approximately one-fifth of service members returning from Iraq or Afghanistan have post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, and one-fifth report experiencing a traumatic brain injury during deployment. SAMHSA works with the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to ensure that American servicemen and women and their families get the effective, high-quality behavioral health treatment and services they need. These services support resilience and can help members of the military and their families find pathways to recovery. While active duty troops and their families are eligible for care from the U.S. Department of Defense, many do not seek out those services because they are concerned that receiving treatment for behavioral health conditions may harm their military career. Military families have a unique culture and behavioral health needs that may not be widely understood. But many military members and their families are seeking care in the community. Communities must be equipped to meet their unique needs. SAMHSA supports the behavioral health needs of America's active duty, National Guard, Reserve, and veterans, along with their families, by leading efforts to ensure that community-based services are accessible, culturally competent, and trauma-informed. Working closely with TRICARE, the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, SAMHSA provides state-of-the-art technical assistance, consultation, and training to ensure that veterans, service members, and their families have access to quality behavioral health services. September 26, 1999, I started SETPA. It began as a Spanish language substance abuse program for adults. And back then it, it was and still is the first program in Georgia to earn a license for drug abuse treatment in Spanish. Since then, the agency has grown way beyond my dreams. We now have the entire spectrum of the Institute of Medicine continuum of care that begins with promotion, prevention, treatment, aftercare, and recovery, all in one agency. And that is wonderful. We are about 20 or 30 clinicians that are working every day um, in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. Our direct clinical services provide individual, family, and group counseling to children beginning at age three, all the way to older adults. Our clinicians come from 17 different countries, including most of South America, but also from Brazil and Central America. We need to have like this cultural sensitivity and a cultural competence uh, to help those clients and to understand the, where they are coming from and meet them there where they are. I think the challenges for the Hispanic community in seeking recovery 
is that sometimes we believe that we can do it on our own and we believe that no one can help us because they don't understand what we're going through. Clients have um, difference in, differences in symbols, differences in um, cultural beliefs, religion. They have a lot of shame or, or they also have um, this perception of illness that is different from the, from the people from other countries. We have consumers coming in from 22 Spanish-speaking countries. My mom speaks very limited English, and for her to have someone to understand her when she expresses her feelings, when she opens up and tells her side of the story, I think someone having someone who understands her is very important because they're able to relate to her instead of having someone translate for her. Me sentí bien. I felt good. I felt good because they spoke to me in a language, well, that I speak. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Join the voices for recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Mitra, we were talking about some one model specifically that Patricia mentioned earlier. What other um, efforts um, are available for, for, to address family issues related to substance use disorders and mental health issues? So there are many resources, and that's wonderful. That's the CRAFT model is an evidence-based model for adolescents. There is the matrix model that also has been found to be effective for certain substances um, that has family involvement, relapse prevention, and individual therapy. Uh, we also have several resources on our SAMHSA website uh, that uh, give, uh, uh, let people know where families and individuals who are facing substance use or mental health uh, obstacles in their life uh, where they can seek treatment. Uh, we have our national behavioral treatment locator so they can put their zip code in there and find uh, providers that could help them. They can call our 24 hours, seven, hour, seven days a week free hotline um, to find help. And we have a lot of great uh, resources, not just publications that they can go and order for free or download. But also we have a website on wellness, mm -hmm. how to, and wellness that includes uh, uh, having healthy lifestyles, uh, uh, not smoking, how to sleep the right amount of hours that helps uh, uh, with them feeling better, uh, how to get involved in activities, uh, the social aspect of social connection with just not with family members, but also with the community, maybe p take up something they used to do that they used to love as a hobby that they had forgotten. It was a hobby to take those. Uh, so there are a lot of wonderful resources on our SAMHSA website that uh, individuals and family members could uh, access. Excellent. And how about for the military, Rebecca? Are there special targeted uh, efforts going on? Well, we in the military, there is um, a website that talks about um, strong warriors and the fact that um, if you have a um, post-traumatic stress disorder, any other kind of mental health diagnosis, that you can still be a strong warrior in spite of that. Um, I, I think the other thing that I keyed on that Mitra was talking about is the importance of kind of a, a, a strong foundation um, in what you eat, how you sleep, um, your activity levels. Um, the Army even has what they call the performance triad. So um, focusing on those three areas, eat, move, sleep, um, nutrition, to make sure that um, you have a good foundation for your performance. But isn't it true that many members would probably be hesitant to receive services? What would you say to a member uh, in terms of their fear of any type of retribution? Um, what is the reality that they need, that they're facing 
and, and, and how can we basically allay some of those fears? We see a, a few fears. One is that um, a person's career will be adversely impacted by seeking treatment or seeking help. Uh, another fear is that perhaps a security clearance would be revoked because they've sought uh, counseling um, or if they have an alcohol use disorder or substance use disorder. Um, the fact of the matter is when you reach out for help and you get assistance, uh, you're more likely to be successful in your career and to be able to retain your security clearance because you don't uh, kind of go down this road of not of losing control. And, and so we encourage people to, to reach out. And I'll tell you that um, since 2007, we have increased the number of behavioral health providers that we have in the military. And despite huge increases, um, we're our doors are, are open and we're full and it's hard for us to even see everybody who wants to be seen. Mm -hmm. So even in spite of those those concerns and those fears, people are coming to get treatment. Thank you. Jan, um, related to all the issues that these families could possibly face, I would rank homelessness as, as a major factor. Sure. Talk to me a little bit about how homelessness further aggravates the whole problem of mental and substance use disorders and, and are there services and, and efforts available? Sure. sure, so I mean in terms of recovery, homelessness would be considered foundational. And so those folks who, who are struggling with stable, safe and affordable housing um, I mean, that's, that's a primary issue in terms of, of their ability to, to maintain recovery. Um, there are tremendous efforts. Certainly there's, there's homelessness, uh, there's a homelessness website. Um, some of the barriers and things that they face are without having the capacity to have an address, you, you aren't able to, to access services in the same way. Um, it makes transportation and getting around more difficult. And then once again, when somebody has to present as a homelessness homeless person, um, you know, there there again, some of the the stigma and the shame and and those barriers can present themselves as well. So, Very good. Yeah. Um, and Patricia, how does the state system deal with that? Do you do you offer housing first, and and after that you stabilize the person, and then you begin to offer some other services? Yeah, um, in New York State, OASIS um, directly funds um, some housing programs and can move people from temporary supported housing to permanent housing. So um, there are options also within the treatment um, community for uh, community residence programs for families um, as well as community residences for the individual who is impacted with family services as a support. But I, I, it is foundational. You mm -hmm. have to have a safe place um, from which to recover. And mm -hmm. so um, it's something that um, New York State through Medicaid redesign has put um, a lot of emphasis on expanding the options for people who are seeking recovery um, to have affordable housing and access to it. And I suspect that after you, even after you find housing for them, these homeless families still need a special targeted uh, mm -hmm. methodologies to deal with that traumatic experience, correct? Oh, absolutely. I think that anybody who's experienced any housing insecurity at all, and certainly to the point of actual homelessness, there is a trauma associated mm -hmm. with that. And um, I think that you need to develop um, you know, services and support around that family to help um, them to be able to feel secure um, and to be able to uh, recover. Very good. Um, Jan, you've had personal experience with um, uh, addiction. And, yes. and do you wish to share some of that, your story? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, I have been in recovery for 20, 29 years. Um, I got I got sober uh, when I was 22 years old. So people would suggest that that's a very young a young age to get recovery. Um, fortunately, I, I my father was a career military officer, and so I had access to treatment very quickly. Um, I needed long term care, so I was in in treatment for about 16 months, and after that time needed ongoing outpatient support. I've, I've had to rely on the use of medication. So I think I've probably used all of the pathways to recovery, um, fortunately with success. Very good. Um, and in that, in that context, uh, Jan, what were some of the more positive 
aspects of, of getting your, yourself some help that your family uh, was able to provide to you. you? You mentioned that your father was in the military, so right there, you know, the fact that the services were available, Absolutely. that's a big plus. Correct. A lot of families don't have that. Sure, sure. But in terms of the family dynamic itself, well, my, my family participated in my treatment, um, so that was extremely helpful. Um, and, and they got some education themselves, which was helpful for them. They also did some kind of recovery work for, for their care and not specifically for my own. So I think that that was also very helpful. Like what, Jan? You want to be more specific? Sure. Um, the, the, the treatment program provided uh, a family program, so that was kind of a place for them to start. Um, it was a four or five day family program. And then beyond that, participating in ongoing counseling, participating in my counseling sessions, of course, um, using using the, their church family and community was very helpful. Um, relying on their extended family, certainly in, in African American families, that's something that's very important. Um, so my mom has a has a big family of support. So I mean that that notion of it, it taking a village really really is so. And I think this is something that families in our audience really need to to pay attention to, right, uh, Mitra? Because you've had a little bit of experience as well yourself, and and that is so important that the family come together. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, uh, as uh, you mentioned. Uh, um, there are many different pathways to recovery. I want to congratulate you Thank for you. Your, your recovery. Thank That's you. wonderful. Um, and um, it's uh, everyone can go. There mm -hmm. is a mm -hmm. light at the end of the mm -hmm. tunnel. Um, and I think the family is so important because they give you that support, mm -hmm. the hope, and um, teach you strategies of how to deal maybe, I mean, your therapist does teach you that, but you still need that family to help you when you're facing stresses, when you're facing challenges, your family is there to support you. Mm -hmm. And for some people, uh, is maybe, a, is it because this is a chronic nature, so it's a long yes, it journey. <laughs> so you need that uh, peer support, the friend support, and the family to help you through your journey. Mm -hmm. Well, when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about what are some of the elements to the family dynamic of providing that resiliency for the family and additional information. We'll be right back. I have been in recovery for 29 years. Um, I had the good fortune of uh, being able to go to treatment when I was 22. Uh, I was in treatment for an extended period of time, about 16 months, and during that time really got to learn how to live. Um, I needed that extended period of time so that I could have a birthday and be sober and I could, I could just do what I needed to do. Um, and so that was the beginning of my journey and, uh, and it's, been, it's been good ever since. For families that have a young person who is struggling with, with early signs or, or full blown, uh, the, the piece that's really important is to be sure to get, to get them help um, and to not give up. Those, those are things that are pretty significant. The recognition that there may be setbacks um, and, and that really is indeed a lifelong process. And so there, there will be different stages and phases of, of recovery and, and what somebody might do early on won't look exactly like what they do uh, further down the road in their recovery. Recovery has brought an amazing life beyond what I, I would have ever imagined that could be possible. Uh, when I first entered into recovery, I thought that if I simply got back the things that I had loved and lost, that that would be sufficient. And, and had that been the case, I would have really sold myself um, and, and God short. And so uh, the things that I do these days are, are, again, things that I wouldn't have ever been able to imagine. I now serve as an ordained uh, deacon in the Episcopal Church. Uh, that certainly wouldn't have been possible. I started a, a recovery community organization about 10 years ago uh, with, the, with the hope that we would catch people as they were transitioning from, from treatment centers or jails and things like that. For those with a mental or substance use disorder, recovery starts when you ask for help. Join the Voices for Recovery. Speak up. Reach out. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. 
for more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back. Rebecca, we are talking about when families are completely supportive and they come together, which is really utopia and ideal. For those scenarios where families are really traumatized by a very severe act, particularly from, from um, members of the military who have been injured, mm -hmm. what are the real dynamics and how, how should the member deal with them and their family's member deal with them? I, I think what you're getting at is um, when, sometimes when a service member is in combat, uh, they may experience something that, that results in post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, um, related substance abuse, or sometimes they're, e they're even injured to the point that they're disfigured when they come back. And those kinds of injuries um, don't only impact the service member. They can impact the entire family. And so um, in those cases, then, uh, going back to what Jan said, we want to put our arms around the entire family and realize that um, the, the, the children in the family may experience their parent with a different kind of personality than before they left. And, um, and those are the kinds of things that we want to identify and treat. And you have special efforts in order for them to, to begin to sort out the different uh, areas where they need help? Yes. Um, so. Ideally, what we try to do is develop resiliency in those families and in the service members even before they go into combat. Uh, the Army has a program called uh, Comprehensive Soldier and Family Fitness, um, which is designed to provide coping skills and communication skills um, and just uh, normalize some of the, the responses that they might have to you know, moving around all the time or having a loved one in harm's way uh, in a combat zone. Um, the, the Navy and the Air Force and the Marine Corps have similar programs. The idea is to um, kind of bolster our service members and their families so that um, when something happens or if something happens, they're prepared for it. And I suspect that the Veterans Administration also deals with them when, once they continue to, to be engaged with th that system. Absolutely. Very Absolutely. good. Uh, Patricia, let's talk a little bit now about, we've been talking about families that have a problem, some of the programs that are, have been proven successful and interventions and so on and so forth. But in reality, uh, Let's look at now prevention. How can families really begin to address potential problems of mental and substance use disorder so it doesn't get to the point where the family becomes problematic or dysfunctional? Yeah, I mean, I think that the stigma that we've talked about and the guilt and the anger that people experience can really be destabilizing in a family sometimes, that um, you um, feel angry toward the person who's having symptoms, you feel blamed by other people. And I think that the community can be helpful from a prevention point of view in building resiliency by understanding more and being um, less judgmental about um, uh, substance use disorder and, and mental health issues. And um, some of the prevention efforts, I think, um, universal prevention efforts, um, have a goal of um, normalizing um, mental health and, and substance use disorders as and they would something include people experience. The reduction of risk factors and 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 the increase in in, in, in protective, protective factors. factors yeah. correct? In some in some cultures, uh, um, there is a increase in uh, protective factors um, naturally because there is an arms around kind mm -hmm. of um, a, of a impulse um, and a community that people um, are tied to very tightly. In other cultures, um, there is more isolation around the um, uh, the kind of nuclear family, mm -hmm. and so. I, but I think that families is where you learn those protective factors, where you find one individual who you re feel connected to. Yeah, uh, and from a systems perspective, Patricia, this uh, the states. Um, can avail themselves the st state prevention frameworks mm -hmm. and yes. communities can actually plan activities and mm -hmm. and develop coalition building in order to create a, a more preventive environment for the young people? 
New York State got a grant from SAMHSA, uh, $10.1 million in uh, 2009, to work with 11 coalitions around New York State to um, develop community-based um, uh, um, universal prevention methods. And we saw um, a, a great advantage of that and reduced um, negative consequences in adolescents from substance use. And Jan, beyond the, the structured coalition building also, what, what do families need to uh, have ever present in terms of really developing those protective factors? Sure. I, I think that the family support for one another, we offer a, a parents group at the center that I run. And, and this is a weekly group where initially it was very interesting because I did a lot of the talking and, and provided a tremendous amount of education. But as the time has rolled on, I simply turn the lights on um, because they're able to share their lived experiences with one another. They're able to talk about what's working and what's not working. Um, they know the resources that are available to them in, in, in our community and beyond. Um, and so they've really been able to take it upon themselves. Um, Many of them have joined some of the larger advocacy groups. Um, the Addicts Mom is one. They've gotten, they they have become a, a tremendous part of the face and voice of recovery. Families have, and and I think because of that, the movement is is th greater things are beginning to happen. Um, and, and even in terms of some of that stigma and shame, because now we are someone's mother or someone's daughter or somebody's sister or brother instead of, you know, the addict or the, the person with a mental illness. And so those, those types of things, now that, that it's a family movement and that, that family members identify themselves as people in recovery, which uh, has, has been a, a change that we've seen over the past several years. Very good. And Mitra, for the physician that is dealing with a person with an addiction problem who has children, um, uh, what, what can that physician do to get that person that they're treating to understand that addiction is a family, uh, an entire family issue? Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's really important to bring, I mean, if, if the patient, of course, is an adolescent, it's very varies versus being an adult. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so th it's the consent process that you need to get their consent. And a lot, many adolescents, they won't seek treatment if they don't, they feel that their privacy uh, is going to be, uh, they're not going to get that privacy issue that they want. But the family is really important. I think the physician can be involved and first speak to the adolescent privately, not even get the families involved or the parents and do some motivational interviewing with the adolescent and find out how, bring that change talk that where is their motivation, why do they, if they want to change and let them know about the consequences and then get the consent of the adolescent that could we bring your family in to get that support that will help you in this recovery process. Uh, and of course, recovery, I mean, has many parts as far as treatment, both for adolescents and for adults. There is uh, recovery can include medications, uh, counseling, uh, psychosocial behavior, therapy like cognitive behavior therapy, um, and uh, social su support, uh, like going to AA meetings, to going to Narcotic Anonymous. It's just not only for the individual, but also for the family members. There are many uh, social support services to help the family. So Mitra, this country is really um, dealing with right now an opioid epidemic of sorts. And, and I know that we've talked about families and, and the role that they can play, but many of these families are really very fearful mm -hmm. because it's happening a, across the socioeconomic spectrum. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, you know, I have three children myself. And uh, I have two teenage boys and a daughter who is 11 years old. And I have that fear. Um, and you see it all across the nation. This is affecting everyone. It's from all incomes, from all walks of life. Uh, um, it's really important to be highly e educated about this. So I think you need to be, uh, families need to be empowered 
that uh, they understand what we are facing and talk to their children about it. Uh, the coping skills is really important. I, they need to teach them how to do problem solving. Um, if they are having any mental health issues, early intervention. Try to get them for treatment very early on. Um, but uh, get them and find out. I mean, if you see your adolescent, suddenly their grades are dropping. They're not going to school. Um, they're not doing what they, the activities that they used to like to do. This is a warning That's sign That's a warning for you sign. That you need to Absolutely. do Absolutely. Well, something. you know, and, and I think, um, I think you, all of you have hit this point. It's really start a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Address it and start talking That's about right. it. When we come back, we're going to talk about how faith influences the family dynamics and mental and substance use disorder. We'll be right back. Recovery is a process. And people who, are, who have been through it before can help someone through the, the next steps. And they can help people learn what to do, how to do it, but also um, they, they've been there and they have had those feelings and they've had the, the, the struggles and so they can, they can be the support person that, that says, yeah, I know how that is and this is how I got through it. So they, they are in many ways coaches and, um, and support people that, that get it in a way that other people that are not in recovery might not. We know that early childhood trauma in particular, but trauma throughout the life course, is related to higher incidence of both um, mental illness and substance use disorders. And so providers of substance use disorder treatment need to be particularly sensitive to the fact that their patients may have experienced some trauma and that that trauma may be linked to their substance use and perhaps co-occurring mental illness. And without addressing that trauma in a sensitive way, they may not be able to help that person recover. SAMHSA has a number of resources to help providers um, become better, to, to deliver better trauma-informed care. We have toolkits. We have a, a, a center, the GAIN Center, which is a technical assistance center. And we have documents that can either be for patients or for the providers themselves that, that help them learn more about how to be trauma-informed. <music> I came to SEPTA when I was 13. I was, you know, prescribing pills to myself and doing other kinds of drugs, but I didn't want to recognize as an addiction. And I didn't think that I had an, a problem and I didn't need help. I tried everything to make her change, to help her stop using drugs, to not walk down the wrong path. I sometimes would say, no more. This is as far as I go. I can't handle her anymore. But I did not surrender with the help from the clinic. And today, uh, she's a leader. She is a youth leader for any young person that ever thought they could not have a good life or that they not see a path to wellness or happiness. She's a role model. I believe SEPTA is very unique. I think the way they do things is very different from other programs out there. The way that they around everything are based off love and caring for each other and actually being there for the family. We try to, to bring that family together in treatment and through the activity, activities we offer at the clubhouse. It's a place where you're able to be yourself and a place where you're able to share your story and your difficult times and your good times. The clubhouse also provides um, opportunities with uh, skill building. They make us realize that we have dreams and that we're able to accomplish them. And just being able to have people who support you with what you believe in, I think it's great. 
Me siento orgullosa de mi hija. Que yo nunca pensé que iba a cambiar. I am proud of my daughter. I never thought she would change. But thank God everything changed. She is better now. Y esta mejoró la. Le doy gracias a Dios. I thank God that Setpa helped me with my children and continues to help me. What we've done here is provide the best service that we can and be able to continue to learn from our community to see what their needs are. And that's made us very good at what we do. My story is yours. I am a mother. I'm a father, a son, a daughter. I am in recovery from a mental illness, a substance use disorder. With support from family and community, we, we are, are victorious. victorious. Join the Voices for Recovery, our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Jan, you know, we, we really have been talking about families, and, and we should have done this at the beginning of the show, which really define for us what family is. I mean, because, you know, there's a traditional family, and what other families are there? Sure. So most people think of the traditional or nuclear family, um, which would be one's parents or siblings, and then the extended family um, would be aunts and uncles and grandparents and folks like that. Um, we see more families of heart or families of choice is kind of the language that the people are using. And those are friends, um, there, there certainly could be other caregivers, um, there would be relationships of, of same-sex couples, um, but, but it really is about uh, having people around you who are supportive, who want the best for you, that you're very emotionally engaged with. And so not making the assumption that um, family means biological or, or nuclear family. And within that context, let's take it uh, uh, one step forward in terms of how does faith uh, uh, influence, can positively influence what's going on in, in, in these families if they're experiencing mental or substance use disorder issues? Sure. I think faith, first and foremost, kind of gives people their guiding values and principles by which they live. Um, it certainly plays a, a role in terms of motivation. Um, it's, it's kind of the place where people make their decisions from. Um, their, their faith community can also be a primary part of their community and where they turn to for, for support. So there's, there's many, many aspects of faith um, and spirituality that play a role in, in one's recovery. And I suspect, Mitra, that faith uh, uh, leaders can be an instrument. Uh, I know we're at SAMHSA, we're teaching, we're training mm -hmm. uh, faith leaders to be able to take certain aspects of ESPERT and be able to assess people and talk about that in their congregations. But I'm, I'm interested also in hearing from you uh, in terms of a recent study that JAMA has released, you were talking about. Exactly, the um, JAMA, so the Journal of American Medical Association Internal Medicine released this study and they looked at 70, 75,000 women for 20 years. And they found that uh, individuals who attended once more, or more than once uh, uh, services uh, at, at different churches, they found that they had decreased in cardiovascular mortality, decreased in cancer mortality, and the researchers thought that this could be probably, but they don't know, but they say maybe it's because it gives them hope mm -hmm. and you have that social support. So it comes out to that bigger families, mm -hmm. so it's not that, uh, so we keep thinking of does, uh, that nuclear mm -hmm. family, but really the family is that whole social support that uh, you get from going to church Absolutely. or going to any community activities, uh, um, so that's uh, peers, uh, fam everyone, so it's really helpful. And I suspect, Patricia, also beyond the faith movement that getting services that are culturally mm -hmm. uh, specific to your, to your uh, uh, ethnic or racial group also is helpful. 
Yeah, I, people need to feel comfortable to access services. It's such a big leap of faith that people are taking when they do actually walk in the door. And um, I think that it's uh, especially important that people can see themselves in that, um, in, in whatever that helping service is. In New York, um, obviously in New York City, it's a very culturally diverse um, city. And so uh, we, um, treatment providers often work in the community with the, um, the staff uh, from the community with a understanding of what that community's cultural values um, are um, and to create a welcoming environment. And I suspect uh, linguistic familiarity mm -hmm. uh, with that particular ethnic group is also very helpful. It's extremely helpful. I, I mean, it's so it's ideal to be able to go to somebody who is not only from your cultural background, but also ha, um, speaks the language that you're most familiar with. Uh, you know, so it, services are available in uh, virtually all languages. In mm -hmm. uh, one block in New York City and Queens, there's 26 different languages that are spoken, and so that uh, it's, it's a, a challenge. And sometimes it's a, you, you don't reach the ideal, but um, uh, in most cases, people can find a service that, um, that where there's a person who is uh, speak uh, language of their um, their. their so for families with. that are seeking help, Patricia, and I'm going to stay with the state because a lot of them, I know that Mitra mentioned the 1-800 number that SAMHSA provides, 1-800-662-HELP. Mm -hmm. But in the state, if, if they don't have um, knowledge of that particular number, which they all will because they're going to watch this show, but um, where can families go in a state system to, to begin to, to sort out their issues and to get help? Uh, OASAS has a hope line that is uh, 24 hours um, uh, staffed by uh, clinical people. So um, there's somebody available uh, 24 hours a day for people to reach out to. Very good. Um, so we talked a little bit, Jan, and you mentioned about discriminatory practices within society for individuals in recovery. And um, I just want to note that what would you tell families if they feel at all threatened and are hesitant to seek help? What, what message are you going to give to them in order for them to really reassess sure. and, and to sure. be able to seek help? To never give up. Um, and, and just the recognition that, that their loved one's lives depend upon um, not ever giving up. Very good. And now we come to one of my favorite segments of the show where I ask you for final thoughts and I'm going to go around and I'm going to start with Patricia. Any, any final thoughts for our audience? Well, one of the things that I've been thinking is that for an individual um, to be successful, one of the resiliency factors that always shows to be one of the most important, and I think this is related to your research, is to have at least one individual in their life that they've made a connection to, that they feel accepted by, and that they um, can, um, and that they stay connected to. That could, uh, that's very often that person is of your family, at least that first person, whether it's your um, biological natural family or some, a family of choice but over time that extends I think to the faith community and if you're not connected to the faith community there are lots of other options as well um, to find somebody to support your recovery and I think families need that as well um, for that kind of resiliency to face the, the difficulties and the challenges of uh, working with somebody who is in recovery. Very good. Jan. So the, the, the first and most important piece is that recovery is indeed possible and that, that people do recover to include family members. So um, that, that it's an amazing lifestyle. It's been a, a life beyond my wildest dreams. Um, and, and certainly just the acknowledgement that sometimes people do have setbacks. Um, and and when, when and if that happens, to, to very quickly get back on the path of, of recovery. Um, I'd say the other piece that I find to be extremely important is, is the reminder to others who are in recovery that, that when appropriate, when it's time and, and when they're available to do it, is that we need to speak out. Um, this idea of speaking up and speaking out and making sure that, uh, that we put a face and voice on, on recovery, that people can have hope. Um, and, and, and it's just, it's an amazing, amazing life worth living for sure. Thank you. Okay, Mitra, last thoughts. Um, I agree. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say, that recovery is possible. 
Uh, I've seen it not only my own patients, but I've heard so many stories, and personally from our own family. Uh, it's, it's a long journey for some people, and um, it is possible, so just keep that hope and have that support, the family, the peers, uh, um, the social support from if you're going to a church or any community work that you're doing, keep that hope that this is possible and it will happen. Rebecca. You know, I think that what I find very important is that whether it's an individual or the individual's family, realizing that you're not alone in this and that you can come forward and get support, whether the support is um, from a healthcare provider, in, in a faith-based organization, um, or in what Harold Cudler and I in um, the journal on the future of children called Communities of Care. Communities of Care and Family, um, there, that's a very loose definition, but it's about the support for the individual and their families. Excellent. Well, I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. You can get information from the SAMHSA website at recoverymonth.gov. And you can plan events for September and really all year round. Uh, our information is always there for you to create events, activities, and to engage that community. And if you are so moved to really engage your entire family in speaking about recovery and supporting those that are in recovery. It's been a wonderful show. Thank you for being here. To download and watch this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.